Good morning. Good morning. This is. He's giggling because we were chatting about our day, and we saw we went a few seconds we, over. We did it again. <laughs> Sometimes, right before morning light starts, we start talking, and <laughs> we get so engrossed. Isn't that wonderful to have a spouse that you're so engrossed in conversation with her? You miss your own broadcast by you, a minute. <laughs> not that you miss your broadcast, but that you have such a wonderful person to oh, chat shucks. with. Thanks, honey bunny. This is the new People that knew the broadcast are saying, who is, is this, this and what? what is going on? <laughs> this is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Yay. Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and have been doing so in our sixth year now. And we are at the in the Book of Acts. We've gotten out of the Book of Numbers and into the Book of Acts. I've wanted to say that for a long time. <laughs> uh favorite preacher quote, uh, not necessarily one of my favorites, but one that you hear a lot. Acts chapter 3 today. How are you? Have you had your coffee this morning? <laughs> we barely have. We because. are working on our coffee this morning. We had a busy, busy day yesterday. I didn't open my eyes till 6.30 and for a normal person, mm -hmm. that would be like sleeping till 11 when you had to be at work at 7. <laughs> but he did his homework last night. He finished. He did his Bible study while we were busy, Christian and I. We've had our grandson with us for three, well, he's with us for a week. And if you remember, our darling Jennifer, um, Christian, is her youngest, and he turned 16. So we're treating him real, real special and giving him some sweet things while... He's with us this week. So Acts chapter 3, the man at the gate beautiful. Mm -hmm. In Acts chapter 3, we find Peter and John, the original odd couple. John is this guy who we might think of him as uh, kind of a girly man. He, <laughs> he lays his head on Jesus' shoulder while Jesus is teaching and Whereas Peter, he's Mr. Man of Action, let's cut somebody's ear off. And now they they had several interactions during the lifetime, the earthly life of Jesus. And, you know, they were intimately involved together during the events surrounding the resurrection. And now here they are together. And these guys would not normally... Do you have friends in your life that if you weren't Christians, you probably wouldn't be hanging out together? Uh God told Abraham that his seed would be as the stars of the heavens, and he told him to tell, count the stars, or tell the stars. That word tell is actually means to draw a line. And I'm not suggesting let's read our horoscope, mm -mm. but the point being is stars are arranged in constellations. And in Christ, we have these eclectic arrangement of relationships that are there to imply a testimony about the gospel. And again, it's someone that you might not even hang out with. Some people in your life are like the stars, and you have this eclectic connection with them. Some people are like big balls of gas. Other people are like planets. They just kind of orbit around you. And again, this is not astrology. This is something based on what God has said. Well, here Peter and John, they're in each other's uh, the orbital path and uh, they go to the gate beautiful and there's a crippled man who had been there his whole life somebody said what did you just say I don't know if I'm awake yet but we've had teaching on that in the past I need to teach more extensively about it but uh, here's this man who's been there at the gate beautiful and he's laid there every single day and why didn't Jesus heal this guy why did Jesus not heal the man at the gate? Beautiful. Jesus had seen this person, no doubt, every time he went in and out of the temple. He would have passed right by this fellow, crying out for alms, crying out for, for uh, someone to pay attention to him, to do something for him. Uh, it's very interesting question to ask. And then looking at what Peter and John actually did. There are many, many lessons that will help you understand how to close the gap between New Testament demonstration of power 
in our own seeming powerlessness at times. Mm -hmm. And so we'll begin by reading the first 12 verses of Acts chapter 3. We're moving right along in Acts already, praise God. Verse 1, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the temple uh, gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Jesus, and I'm sorry, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk, rise up and walk. Yes, amen. And he took, isn't it interesting, we talked about this earlier in our Bible studies, that Jesus walked by him every single day, never did address him. Guy never did call out to Jesus, because Jesus only did what he saw the Father do. And he left this man every day with a without a guilty conscience, because that's what you do when you just do what you see the Father do. Verse 7, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, I'm sorry, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at signs and wonders at that, that which had happened to him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them <laughs> in the porch that is called Solomon's Great Wondering. And when Peter saw it, he said unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk. Isn't that a happy moment? Mm -hmm. man's up walking and leaping and praising God, Amen. hanging on to Peter and John. You wouldn't think they were fixing to get beat half to death for I doing know, that. For what they did. But what a, what a, a happy moment happy. that is. Mm -hmm. So in verse 1 of our chapter, we find Peter and John going to the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. Now the ninth hour of the day is hour 3 p.m. And there was a tradition going uh, back to Isaac when the scripture says Isaac went out in the field to meditate and pray. And I believe if you'll check, you'll see that's when he met Rebecca. Mm -hmm. when Rebecca was brought to him and he mm -hmm. saw her in the field. And it was believed that that was in 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was also the time that Elijah looked up to heaven and prayed down fire on the altar when he was confronting the 450 uh, prophets of Baal. Yeah, that, it's also yeah. when Jesus bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Amen. It's also when the veil was rent in uh, Twain during the ninth hour of the day. It's mm -hmm. also when Cornelius was praying and the angel came and knocked on his door because he was giving such amazing alms yeah. to the Lord. It's uh, also uh, when, what was the other one? Uh, it'll come back to me in just a minute. Oh, it's also when uh, Peter, the following that was up on the roof, he, taking a nap. Wait a minute, he's supposed to be praying. He's uh -huh. taking a nap. Oh, it happens, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> and, and how, ma how many of you go to pray and you wind up checking your eyelids for cracks? <laughs> so, so <he's> <laughs> Peter had a habit of doing that. Jesus, remember he said, you mm -hmm. know, go, you just go ahead and sleep now. Couldn't you just tarry with me? He, Peter needed to get Larry Lee's syllabus yeah. and could you not tar tar tarry. tarry with me? One hour. <laughs> what happens when you go to sleep when you pray? Your friends will send the smoten angel. Mm, Peter, wake it, you. Peter, you know he had to be, a, they called him the big fisherman. He had to be a big fella because the angel came to break him out of jail. Yep. And he was laying there chained between all these soldiers. And the angel 
said, wake, wake up and gave him a nice little speech and he was still asleep and said the angel smote him. And so if, if you're going to have prayer time with your friends, they'll send the smoten angel. Thank you. That happened to me, and I've been waking up in the wee hours of the morning for 30 years. I wish my friends hadn't have done that. Or maybe <laughs> I don't. But. No, you don't. This has worked <laughs> for you all this time. So this was a time when the evening oblation would be offered up with Three measures of meal. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Flour, which is ground wheat, mingled with oil. And it was also a time when they would prepare to do this, that in the temple, and of course Daniel prayed. Remember, Daniel prayed three times a day. This is one of the times that Daniel would pray. But all across Jerusalem, everybody would stop and pray. And there would be total silence. And it was a great uh, moment of social equity because the priests would go quiet. The commoners would go quiet. Kings would go quiet. Everybody would get quiet in the temple because this is the moment they turned their face toward the temple. And you've got to understand what's happening at this moment. They're turning their face toward a riven veil. Do you understand what, what's taking place? that this, this miracle took place at a very key hour, and also they disrupted. They disrupted the protocols, okay? What, what happens if we're taking the offering and God decides to do a, do a miracle? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll uh, let him. In other words, there was a lot of people that weren't too happy that this, you're, you're messing up our good church service. You're <laughs> messing up our, you know, our goings on. <laughs> and... Uh, and so at this time of prayer, the preparation was made by the priests for offering an offering consisting of three handfuls of flour mingled with oil. What do you do with flour? You make bread. John 6, 35. Jesus declared he was the bread of life. He also said in Luke 4, 18, he declared he was anointed with oil from heaven. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me. So Jesus is the three measures of meal, of flour, mingled with oil. Those three measures are a type of Jesus personified. The flour mingled with oil uh, that was offered not only in the earthly temple, but in the temple made without hands, the temple that Jesus was, because he referred to the temple as his body. The three measures, listen, speak of the threefold humanity, the threefold nature of the humanity of Christ, his spirit, his human spirit, his soul, and his body, offered up as the offering of heaven for the sins of man. Mm -hmm. So at the time of this offering, God in his foreknowledge brought this miracle about to signify that this ceremonial offering, he's saying to all of Israel and to you and I, that those prayers have been answered. They've been fulfilled in the substance who is Christ himself. The shadow is done away with. We now have the substance who is Christ. Now, in, we see in verse 2 that this certain man who had lain daily at the gate called Beautiful, he's there again today, and come to the attention of Peter and John. Now, this took place within 90 days of the resurrection. So this man had been there his whole life. Why didn't Jesus, like Kitty said, why didn't Jesus heal this man? Jesus certainly saw him. In fact, it is doubtless that Jesus passed by this man more than once in his comings and goings from the temple in his lifetime. Why didn't Jesus heal the man when he saw him? I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> Listen, Look at John chapter 5, verse 19, one of the three great maxims that I live my life by. Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, and he was coming out of the gate beautiful. I'm sorry, he was coming away from the pool of Bethesda where he healed one man and left multitudes lying on the, on the ground. He said, the son can do nothing but what he sees the father do. They say, well, that's Jesus, but he applied it to us when he said, Without me, you can do nothing. 
-hmm. He said, I can do nothing without the Father. You can do nothing without me. So since Jesus knew he could do nothing of himself but what he saw the Father do, we are to do nothing in ourselves but what we see Jesus do. Amen. What do you see the Father doing? <clears throat> what do you see Jesus doing? Jesus did not operate by a set of religious protocols or moral principles. He just simply did what he saw the Father do. That's how it was intended to be before Adam and Eve fell. When they fell, they got this comparative axis of a balance of right and wrong working on the inside of them called a defiled conscience. And they're reeling between those two polar opposites like a pinball in a pinball machine trying to somehow find the middle ground. And the Bible says there's a way that seems right in demand, but the end thereof is destruction. How many of you have tried to do right and wound up making a mess that you had to clean up? We're not called to live our life reeling between these polar opposites of a defiled conscience that has been contaminated by what happened when we partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and thus were contaminated by the sin nature from our very birth and conception. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve knew right from wrong before they ate of the tree. Otherwise, they couldn't have been condemned as sinners, as, as those who disobeyed what was right. It was a singular something. So we don't get that. We tend to define everything in this axis between our sense of right and wrong. It's the, that stereoscopic balance of the good and the evil and somehow get there in the middle. And sometimes we don't care if it's evil to somebody else, if it's right for us. And then we uh, have, you have to understand that the snake in the tree he was an arboreal snake. Arboreal snakes, like the snake that spoke to Eve. Arboreal snakes or tree snakes are the only ones that have stereoscopic vision like a man. In other words, they have depth of vision. Uh, they, can, they have this discretion this just by being able to work from two polar opposites uh, and to determine how to strike their prey. And it's a reflection of what happened in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when man partook of it. But, at, but before that, Adam, how did he know right from wrong? It's what Jesus told Satan in his temptation. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. It is a singular something in the unfallen state. It's the singular, what has the Father said? I'm going to do that, and I don't think past that. Mm -hmm. I don't extrapolate <laughs> past that. And here is Jesus, uncontaminated by sin. He said, all I do is what I see the Father do. And I've been praying that for over 30, now 40 years. Mm -hmm. yeah, but before, when I got this understanding, the very next thing I had to do is confess that I could do a lot of things I haven't seen the Father do. <laughs> <laughs> and make a pretty good mess of things while I did it. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. Well, how could he walk past that man at the gate? Beautiful. I guess that implies a whole lot of doctrine that God wanted him to be sick and all. Mm -hmm. No, no. That's theology filtered through a mind contaminated by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right. No, Jesus only did what he saw the Father do. And if he sees what he, the Father walked right past this guy, he knows it's pointless to do otherwise. I, he said, without him, I can do nothing. And without Jesus, we can do nothing. Keep right on walking. Some of the most significant miracles I've witnessed in my own life. I walked into a, a hospital room where a man had been told he had less than two weeks to live. He was within the final days of his life. And I told the Lord, driving up to, this, to the hospital 40 miles, I told the Lord, weeping, I said, I'm sick and tired of praying for people that don't get healed. I will not pray for this man unless you tell me you're going to heal him. And the Lord didn't tell me he was going to heal him. So guess what I did? I walked into the hospital room and I told him about my conversation with God. I said, I was driving up here. I believe in healing. I know what the Bible says about healing. But I told God that if he didn't tell me he was going to heal you, I'm not praying for you. And I, I apologize for that. But God didn't tell me he was going to heal you. I will not lay empty and empty hands upon you and give you false hope. And then I turned to leave. And when I turned to leave, the Holy Spirit dropped it in my mind about the prophet went to Hezekiah and told him he was going to die. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and cried out to God, and God gave him 15 more years. 
And I, I was walking out of the hospital room. You got to understand, this was the elderly father of a deacon in my church. This would have been the end of my ministry if something didn't happen. Because that deacon would have went back to the other deacons. I hadn't been in that church long, and they would have just got rid of this guy. I'm walking out of the hospital room. I turned back around, and God spoke to me about Hezekiah. I said, however, <laughs> let me tell you a Sunday school story about Hezekiah. And I told him the story. This guy didn't know his Bible. And as I sat there and told him the story, this man, this dying man, cried out, began to cry out, and he turned himself with great effort on his deathbed to the wall and Come began on. to cry out to God. Come on. The, it was like I, one of the most potent experiences of God's presence I've ever felt. Just, oh, it was like the angel of the Lord walked into that hospital room. Guess what? He didn't die in two weeks. No. He walked out of the hospital in two weeks, a Glory healed man. Glory to God. <laughs> Glory to God. So, how come we don't get miracles? Well, maybe we need to start doing what we see the Father do, and nothing like Jesus more, did. Nothing less. <laughs> see, Jesus indeed healed many, but he did not heal or go about doing miracles as a matter of principle. He did not follow principles of doing good. The Lord told me one time, he said, uh, live by the sword, die by the sword. Live by your principles, die by your principles. I didn't call you to live by principles. I called you to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. Amen. Well, how can you say that? Because as a young pastor, I was trying to figure out, I'd heard Larry Lee say, read the red, talking about the red words of Jesus in the Bible, read the red and pray for the power. And I decided, well, if I just do everything that Jesus did, I'll be walking in the Spirit. And I started doing that. And somebody came and said, uh, I need $600 in the 1980s now to pay an electric bill. And the Bible says, if somebody asks, give, expecting nothing in return. So we raised money in the church to give this unsaved man $600 to pay his electric bill. And he said, I'll be in church. And tears running down his face. I'll see you Sunday. Well, he didn't come to church Sunday, and we drove by his house on the way home, and guess what? He had five kegs of beer, and all of his buddies out having a drunken party about five blocks from the church, and everybody in the church had to drive by his house and see what he did with the money we sacrificed to raise for him, and my heart smote me, and I got home, and I, I was weeping. I was a young man. I said, God, I don't know what I did wrong, but I know I did something wrong. What did I do wrong? He said, you need to listen to what I tell you to do and do that. I didn't call you to live by your principles. I called you to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Mm. And from that day till this, there were other things I had to learn after that, but that became the ruling maxim in my life. And Kenneth Hagin told the story. I ran across that not too long after that, how as a pastor in Texas, before he was Kenneth Hagin that everybody knows, and he was asked to go pray for a man in his church. He had never been to the man's house. He had a vision in his mind of driving into the man's circular drive, walking into his front door, turn left, third door down the hall on the left, walks in, the guy's in his bed. He goes over, lays hands on him, and pulls him out of bed. He's instantly healed. He goes to the man's house. There's the circular drive. It's exactly like he saw it in his vision. He did exactly what he said. He didn't even knock. He just walked in, mm -hmm. turned left, three doors down. There's the man, pulled him out of bed, instantly healed. Glory to God. See, I want to have the track record that Jesus had. Amen. He said, greater work shall you do. Well, we're going to do it the way he did it. Without the Father, he could do nothing. Without him, we can do nothing. Amen, amen. So let's start tracking that. And that's what Peter and John were, were doing. Jesus healed many, but he didn't go about doing miracles as a matter of principle. He did not follow the principles of doing good. Remember, he says, call no man good. He wasn't trying to be good. He wasn't message-oriented in that way. He wasn't trying to make a point. He was just doing what he saw the Father do. He followed the subjective impetus. In other words, it's subjective. You can't enforce it upon somebody else. This is... It's something that you follow in your own heart and mind. This is the way walk you in it, the scripture says, of the Spirit of God speaking over your shoulder. Uh, 
Amen. Do what you see the Father do on a moment-by-moment moment basis. This is what it means in Galatians 5.25 when Paul said, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I spent the first six months after my commitment to follow the Lord in a call to ministry, I spent six months studying this verse and saying, Lord, what does it mean to not just live in the Spirit but walk in the Spirit? The word walk... It took me six months to figure out. That's dance now. It took six months to figure out what it meant to walk in the Spirit. And one day the Lord told me, it's real simple. When you walk, what are you doing? You're progressing by steps. Amen. How do we progress by steps? By religious principles or protocols? Mm -hmm. Nope. By doing what you see the Father do. See, how do we apply this? We do not come to Christ and thenceforward live our lives on our own recognizance, doing the best we can. In Christ, we live by the Spirit. In Christ, we are to walk by the Spirit, not following dead religious principle or our own best guess as to what we ought to do. That's why we fall prey to all these formula books. Uh, Ten steps to your miracle. Protocols of getting your prayer answered. How to hold your mouth right. How to get a uh, hundred angels to dance on the head of a pen and bring you your breakthrough. And we get all this teaching, and it never produces anything in our lives. We are to do like Jesus. Just do what we see the Father do. Oh, but I don't know. Then do what you do know. you got a lot of mistakes to make before you get it right. Mm -hmm. Just go ahead and do it. Why? The Bible says through reason of use, you have, you have your senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You do what you can do, and you think, uh, that was a big train wreck. I guess that didn't work out. That wasn't what the Father told me to do. And then you go back and do it again. So you have to put down pride. Mm -hmm. And so uh, even in the area of teaching, now listen to this. Jesus made the following statement in John seven sixteen. He said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Now, wait a minute. His doctrine was not, he said, I'm not preaching my doctrine. <laughs> oh, really? One thing I want to ask Jesus when we get to heaven is what would he have taught? <laughs> if your doctrine is not your own, what did you want to teach? I think we know. <laughs> you think about that. Right now, what is that like? I was the teaching and evangelistic department chairman of a small denomination for five years. During that time, I was responsible to write books for the founder of our organization. And guess what? His doctrine was not my doctrine. What he believed, and I'm not talking about he was satanic, I'm just saying I didn't believe the things that were very important to him. He, our doctrine was not aligned. But I was, yeah, part of my job description was to say my doctrine is not my own, but the guy who told me to write this book in his name. Mm -hmm. So I know what that's like. And I'd write those books for him, they'd be anointed, and God gave me an anointing to express something that was not that was my founder's doctrine, but not my own. And I spent years doing that. Do you think God was training me? And so uh, just think about that. Where does your doctrine come from? Are you concocting doctrines and teachings out of your own intellect according to what you agree with? Or are we teaching what God gives us, whether it's popular with others or according to our personal taste or not? Now here's another one. John 5.30, Jesus said... I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear, I judge. And that word means make a decision, form an opinion. It's like, you know, the boss that says, if I want you to have an opinion, I'll give it to you. <laughs> but yet we let people out there in the world help us have an opinion. We, they call them opinion makers, the news people that give us the news and all of this kind of, kind of stuff. He says, uh, I can of my own self, John 5.30, do nothing as I hear I judge. Hear what? Hear Charles Brinkley no. on the, you know, hear Robin Mead, hear somebody on the news. Is that how, as we hear? I've had intercessors say, of course we have to watch the news. How else do we know how to pray? Come on. Oh, my goodness. You're a part of the problem. You're not part of the solution. Come on. How about getting it from the Holy Ghost? Yeah, barely. I haven't watched uh, uh, the news or read a newspaper in over six months, and I found that as I do that, my hearing about the nations is keener than it has ever been. 
Amen. God has given me more words for nations than uh, he has ever given me. And I have, if people say, do you hear what happened on the news? I had no idea. No, I don't hear. Trust me, if there's anything going on in the news, your Christian friends that are watching the news, they're going to tell you. you know? And long conversation, we're not going to go there. He said, my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of him, will of the Father that has sent me. So when Jesus passed the man at the gate beautiful, he did so in obedience, listen, not to moral principle. God did not save you to establish a moral compass on the inside of you. You already had that. It's called fallen nature. But he uh, did so in obedience to what the Father did and what the Father did not show him. Now, do you have an opinion that doesn't originate fresh from the mind of God? Think about it. Then that opinion stands between you and what God would desire of you. And you have a decision to make. Either to follow your own whim, your own tendencies, or to wait for the leadership of the Spirit, as Jesus no doubt did. And as Peter is doing this very day, when he addresses the man laying crippled before him, what if he doesn't get healed? That's an opinion. That's an extrapolation based upon an opinion. Uh... If I lay hands on somebody, they don't get healed. If I'm doing what I saw the Father do, then this is whatever happens. Well, that's what the Father wanted to do. Somebody told us one time, if you do what you think God's telling you to do, you will have no credibility in the kingdom. I <laughs> laughed in their face. I said, well, I guess we're not supposed to have any credibility in the kingdom then because you know I'm going to do what I see the Father do. Amen. No, you need to submit to us. You need to do what we tell you to do. Really? My one grandson would say yakety schmackety and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so... In verse 3, Peter and John fix their eyes upon that man. Ever notice how in the meetings when the, when the guys in the wheelchairs come up, we preach right past them? Mm-hmm. We're not fixing our eyes on them. Man, we're looking everywhere. We're like Marty Feldman. You know, we got them eyes like chameleons looking everywhere, but at the ones in the wheelchairs in our mm-hmm. meetings. Oh, no. Fix your eyes upon that impossible case Amen. called Damas and so, And then not only that, hey! Look at us. Yeah. <laughs> Look on us. I thought we we weren't supposed to draw attention to ourselves. Oh no, it's not us. It's not me. It's we Jesus. Know who it is. Religious. That's religious. How many times do we hear that false humility? It's not me. Don't look at me. Look to God. If Peter and John were operating in that religious attitude, this man would have never been healed. What was the man doing when Peter and John addressed him that way? He wasn't looking at them. Why? Because he knew poor Galileans when he saw them. See, Galileans, those were they were brigands. Galileans was basically where they sent all the ones that were troublemakers, and they had a Roman, they had a Roman garrison there uh, because they were notorious troublemakers. And so, if you are a beggar in Jerusalem, you would look to one of the more wealthy people that you could identify by how they dressed or maybe the priest they might do something but you take one look at a Galilean they ain't, they ain't going to give nothing <laughs> maybe a, a wooden nickel uh, so he was looking past them he wasn't looking for them to do anything for him these two ragtag Galileans that he apparently didn't expect too much from you know think about that where's your miracle coming from from the person that you think is least capable of producing anything that you would need, even in the natural. Now, this man's looking right through them, but Peter wants his attention. And after getting the man's attention, the man looks at them expecting to receive something. So you have to create expectation. How are we going to work a miracle? Galatians says, he that works miracles among you. This is a perfect example of working a miracle. It didn't just happen. They're walking by... They got to get the guy's attention. Hey, look at me. Say, see, they're working something. Look at me. Look at me. Do you hear the words coming out of my mouth? You have to get their attention. Oh, no, it's not me. It's God. You just opted out mm. of a water walking miracle. Ouch. You have to understand how miracles work. See, usually we want people to look somewhere other than to us for what they're after. Uh, when I go to Las Vegas, you go to Las Vegas, everywhere you go, you get out of your car and walk in a building, you'll be confronted by a beggar. I look him right in the eye, and I listen to the Holy Ghost, and I do what the Holy Ghost tells me to do. <laughs> They're not used to that. Nope. 
when the man, when the man does look at Peter, notice that Peter doesn't interact with the man on the man's terms. Peter did not reach. Hey, you telling me Peter was broke? Peter was not broke. Mm-mm. Silver and gold have I none. What do you, I believe? I believe what he really meant is I don't have any of that for you. You can't meet people's needs on their terms. Amen. Oh, you follow Jesus. You call yourself a Christian. Sorry. Not that kind. I told somebody that one time. They were trying to manipulate me because I, they knew I was a believer. You call yourself a Christian. I said, not that kind. Mm-hmm. I said, well, what kind are you? I said, I'm the kind that does not operate in a perverted sense of Christian conscience that allows you to demand that I interact with you on your terms. Sorry, I'll interact with you on God's terms. (laughs) Whether you like it or not, you can take it or leave it. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not being mean. I'm loving people on God's terms and not theirs. You're resolute. (laughs) (laughs) Kitty calls that waxing (laughs) apostolic. Mm -hmm. So it's another thing to make note of. People who want a miracle will usually not only expect a healing, they have very definite ideas about how they expect you to go about giving them what they have none of. They don't have a miracle, but they want what they can get on their terms and not yours. So he tells the man, nope, don't have what you want, but I do have what you need. Don't deal with people according to their demands. Deal with them according to their actual needs. They don't get to call the shots. You minister to them on your terms and God's terms, not on the basis of their demands. People that are in need, people that are in positions like this are some of the most demanding, arrogant, prideful people you'll ever meet. And you have to be prepared to deal with it. Oh, how can you say that about a cripple? Because I've been around long, I've been around the teacup long enough to find the handle. And you've got to be able to get inappropriate according to the world's way of doing things if you're ever going to see somebody get a miracle. Amen. So what happens? The man leaps to his feet, walking and leaping and praising God. Isn't that wonderful? What's going to happen? Well, the apostles are fixing to get beat half to death. (laughs) That's the next chapter. Let's read verse 13 through the end of the chapter, please. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate. So he's preaching to the people that are saying, what is going on? He's Mm -hmm. preaching a message to them. And denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised up, raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I want that though, but that through ignorance ye did it as did also your rulers. But those things which God before hath shown by the mouth of his prophets that Christ should suffer, so he hath, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And ye shall, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of them, his holy prophets, since the world began. And Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you like your brethren, like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. And ye are the children of Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindred of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. The word iniquities means wrongfulness. It's a very interesting word. When Peter preaches his message to this crowd gathering to inquire about this miracle, he doesn't mince words. Notice he's not trying to be seeker sensitive. He's not trying to speak something palatable to them. 
He speaks directly to the culpability of those present at, in the crucifixion and the death of the Lord Jesus. He doesn't pander to them just to get them to agree with him. Amen. We often try to soft pedal the message in order to gain a hearing. That's unbelief. You cannot preach faith when you are in, in unbelief. That's right. And don't do the Holy Spirit's job for him, twisting the message and dumbing down the words just so people will smile and say that they agree with you. That's manipulation. Mm -hmm. Speak the truth in love. Mm -hmm. Be straightforward and transparent without apology. Because when you preach to those who do not know Christ and even to, to ourselves, we are culpable in the death of Jesus. It was mm -hmm. our sin that nailed him to the tree. And we are all born an enemy of God with the blood guiltiness of the Son of God upon us. And that is a eternal, universal fact. And when we approach people trying to do what we say in Louisiana to tay-tay them into accepting Jesus, that's pandering, that's vile, that's ungodly. That doesn't mean we have to insult people. We just simply have to speak transparently. In verse 19, we see that Peter doesn't leave them in condemnation. He says, look, repent. The word, remember, we talked about it yesterday. Metanoia, it means to have your, af have an, your after mind, mm -hmm. your after thought. Like someone says, on second thought, that means change your mind. After mind means change your mind and adopt the attitude or the conviction now that you will have when the goodness of God is so poured out upon your life that you will love him and serve him forever. In other words, you have to do it by faith. Okay, well, if God will pour out his goodness upon me, then I will, then I will live with no. He's already done what he's going to do. It's up to you by faith. You have to make a faith determination while you are in the domain of darkness, and that faith determination translates you into the kingdom of his dear son. You have to, to step forward. Now, this, the news of Jesus' death was still circulating. Most of Peter's hearers agreed that Jesus, uh, he's this guy, he's an executed felon, uh, but here Peter's performing this great miracle, and it's placing pressure upon them to change their mind. You think he's an executed felon, I'm telling you this guy's walking around because of the one that you crucified. Mm -hmm. And so if you aren't willing to put pressure on people, Part of bringing people to Christ is putting pressure on them. And, oh, I don't want to do that. Everybody's got a right to their own opinion. See, that's your problem. Mm -hmm. You cannot think that way. We are a part of the kingdom. Greater is the pressure on the inside flowing out than the pressure on the outside trying to get in. You have a river flowing out of you, and you're trying to stop it up. Let me stop up this river so I can have a conversation with this person about Jesus. No, you need to turn the river of God on the inside of you on them like a fire hydrant and Amen. say, do you give up? <laughs> See, Peter's message was compelling. The miracle is undeniable. The context in which Peter extrapolates in his message about the law and the prophets from Samuel on down cannot be denied. He's an unlearned fisherman from the north of Galilee, and Peter is commanding the attention of the most erudite and educated people of his day. Never apologize for your lack of credentials or, edu or education. Be bold in the anointing and bold in the power of the Holy Spirit. In so doing, you'll be used. Remember, Jesus said, go and wait. Mm -hmm. Terry. Mm -hmm. At first he said, now, wait a minute. Jesus, would you make up my mind? <laughs> am I going into all the world and am I, or I'm going and waiting? He says, no, go and wait for power from on high. Then go. Listen, don't look for an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. You don't have to talk about what you demonstrate. Amen. Look for an opportunity to manifest a miracle. Mm -hmm. It's called power evangelism. Mm -hmm. Look for an opportunity to step into a situation in your grocery store, on your job, walking down the street. Perfect example. Kitty and I were getting off of a plane. We were on the jet bridge, oh. and everybody's crowding. This plane was packed. It had been a long mm -hmm. flight, and, and people were wanting to get to their next connection. And this lady was on the left side of the jet bridge, she was swooning up against the bulkhead of the jet bridge, and she could barely put one foot in front of another, tears streaming down her face, and she looked about to faint. 
and Kitty and I stepped over, and Kitty took her by the elbow. I laid hands on her back. Now, listen, stranger, you put your hands on a stranger, you get arrested. And and we began to pray, and we began to talk to her. And we and this woman who was about to fall on the ground, and everybody's going past her, we just began to speak soothing words to her and pray for her. We didn't apologize. We started, mm-hmm. Father, in the name of Jesus. Yes. By the time... We got to the end of the jet bridge. This woman was thanking us, and she was walking off like a runway model because she got an absolute miracle. She was probably 35, 40, and she goes, thank God you came along. She said, I'm a believer, and thank you for just being there. Well, we were just doing what we saw the Father do. That's just what you do, and it's so easy when you yield yourself to what he's saying. And he does the results, and then he gets all the glory. So, Father, thank you for this broadcast today. Thank you for this chapter in Acts. We believe that we receive life from you, and we have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to each one of us as believers. And we will not deny your voice, Father God. We will take action. We will demonstrate. We don't even have to talk sometimes. We just demonstrate the love of God, the life of God, which is the reason you brought your precious Son into our lives. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.